Hello, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started on time. My name is Sharice Magoon, and I'm with UT Health School of Nursing. You are signed in to hear Dr. Nancy Young present on meeting the needs of families affected by substance use disorders and engaging communities and plans of safe care. We are happy to have you join us for the Texas NAS Awareness Month. These free CE presentations are sponsored by Texas Health and Human Services. Before we get started, let me go over a few housekeeping items. Please mute your microphones and also make sure your video is off during the entire presentation. We will take question and answer through the chat. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Young is the Executive Director of Children and Family Futures, a California-based research and policy institute whose purpose is to improve outcomes for children and families affected by substance use disorders. Dr. Young also serves as the director of the federally funded National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, Welfare which provides technical assistance to states in support of their efforts to enhance cross-system collaboration for the benefit of affected families and develops and disseminates information on advances in policy and practice in this field. She received her PhD and Master in Social Work from the University of Southern California School of Social Work. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Young. Well, thank you so much, Sharice, and thank you to all the conference organizers who have worked so hard to transition this meeting to a virtual meeting. We appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to share information with the audience today and appreciate both the Children and Family Futures staff that have worked to make this virtual as well as the conference organizers. So uh, thank you all very much and obviously to the audience who uh, is tuning in today on this important topic. We appreciate you taking your time out of uh, very hectic and very busy days. We all uh, know that this uh, transition to virtual has been interesting uh, to say the least for all of us for our, our work conditions. Let me just start by saying that this uh, presentation and the work uh, supporting it is sponsored by the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, which is a technical assistance uh, center funded by both the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the Administration on Children and Families, um, specifically the Children's Bureau. We've been in existence since 2002 um, we've got lots of materials on our website. You see the, the website address at the SAMHSA uh, website, uh, NCSACW, National Center, Substance Abuse Child Welfare. I would encourage you, if you haven't spent time on our website, uh, to visit uh, after, after the presentation uh, so that you can get the full range of resources that are available on this topic related to infants uh, and, and older children uh, that are affected by parents with substance use disorders. So with that, um, we're gonna uh, do the, the welcome, which just was. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the data about uh, children with parents with substance use disorders that are in the child welfare system that are affected by neonatal absence syndrome. Uh, spend some time on what do we mean by family-centered treatment and recovery and then some specifics on the legislation, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA, that most recently was amended by CARA, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, in 2016. What did that say? What are states uh, responsible for? What are hospitals and health providers uh, responsible for in, in connection to implementing, developing, implementing, overseeing plans of safe care for infants and their families. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what states have been doing in terms of collaborative practice uh, to meet these requirements and to improve outcomes for these infants and their families. So some data. Um, first, we'll start with some data on where is this group, the audience from? What's your primary uh, discipline or area in which you work. So Sharice, can we launch that poll? Yep, 
We have very few people that have voted yet. So, uh, okay, here we start to see some results. Terrific, we have some nurses, social workers, counselors, uh, chemical dependency counselors. It may have been hard to decide between those two. <laughs> um, we'll take, uh, we've got about under half of the audience that's voted, so we'll wait a little bit more to get uh, additional responses. While we're waiting, I will mention that uh, if you put your questions in the chat box, um, Sharice will be accumulating those and we'll take some breaks a couple times for questions throughout the presentation but also leave time at the end for uh, for questions. Uh, so we have just over half who have uh, voted but why don't we go ahead and and end the poll on that and see who's in our audience. Let's see, Sharice, do you have the ending the poll coming? There we go. Sharing I just ended it. And I also, I also had included that other question you asked, just so you know, I didn't know. So the oh. plans of safe care was on there. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. okay. So we'll see results of both at the same time. That's fine. Um, let's look at those results. Uh, so uh, about a third, just over a third social workers. Um, let's see if I can move down here a little bit. Uh, a quarter of responses from chemical dependency counselors and, and just about a quarter from other counselors. So, uh, and about a small but mighty force of nurses. So uh, great, we're appreciative of that and you taking your time today. And then second question was related to uh, what the uh, level of understanding of plans of safe care right now. So uh, just over half or 60% or almost have uh, somewhat understanding and a third have a lot of understanding about plans of safe care. So that's great, that's great. So we'll um, get to that content and understand that uh, a fair number of you already have uh, information about plans of safe care. Okay, so let's see if uh, I probably get rid of that. Okay, great. That's... And going back to the next screen. All right, here we go. So some sharing some data, uh, starting with some data. Many of you are probably very familiar with this chart. It, it shows uh, 18 years since 2000, which is just after the Adoption of Safe Families Act went into effect, and states were making great strides in reducing the number of children in out-of-home care. These are the national numbers. Uh, you see the low point at just under 400,000 in 2012, and then inching back up uh, to the most recent data that are available publicly are 2018. This is point in time. How many kids were in foster care, out of home care, in child welfare at September 30th, point in time data? Um, when we look at those data for Texas, uh, you see this, the scale for Texas is on the right side and um, a different pattern. Um, this isn't what we typically see. We typically see in states that they follow that, that curve of the national data, uh, but uh, Texas didn't have that uh, big dip. Uh, in 2009 was your low point after the increases between uh, 2000 and 2006. Um, this, I, as I recall, there was also a change in the information system in Texas. So that could be some of that change in the increasing numbers in the early 2000s. Um, but your numbers of kids, the static population has continued to increase 
uh, since the late 2000s uh, through the, the 2010s. Uh, uh, so again, that's a little bit different population or different pattern than what we see in many states. And many of you in the audience may have explanations for that, um, but we wanted to point that out just to sort of ground us with how many kids are we talking about. So roughly 30,000 children in Texas who are in uh, child welfare and out-of-home care. One of the data items in that same data set um, called APCARS uh, is an item that social workers, caseworkers, when uh, children are, are entering the child welfare system, um, it's the, is this related to parents' alcohol or drug use? Um, the way that the data item is uh, defined now is, uh, is a condition of removal that's changed just recently in that data set. But the, is alcohol used by the parent, is drug use by the parent a factor in the case? And you see nationally, it's continued to go up um, to about 40% in 2018. We believe this is much more about the data collection than the actual. We rarely get anyone that says, yeah, this is what it seems like in our community, except in Texas, it might be very different. Here are that, the same data in Texas. And you're one of the states of a handful of just a few that many years ago, uh, when you made a change in your information system, this item about parents' alcohol or drug use is recorded in much more consistent ways. Um, we do think that it's a lot about, again, data collection, but when you see the variation across the states of the percentages by state, so, so again, in that state, what percentage of kids entering out-of-home care have a parent that have an alcohol or drug problem, and if you will, the box was checked. So in the data system, it was identified that parents had an alcohol or drug problem. Now, the reason why we often talk about this being a data collection issue and how well Texas, Oregon, Maine, Indiana um, are doing on this is if you look at Louisiana, um, your border uh, to the east, uh, they have one of the lower percentages of that data item. And, and we don't really believe that Louisiana has so much less in terms of parental alcohol or drug. Another example is Maine and New Hampshire. Um, Maine and New Hampshire have a similar kind of impact, particularly of opioids in the region. Uh, and yet the data system doesn't um, reflect that. Another one, California and Oregon. Of course, being from California, I typically say we just uh, you know, may, manage to get a lot of those parents across the border. But, but, but you're to be congratulated that this is something that you are focused on in your child welfare system, that you are collecting data about. Uh, and again, showing that more than two thirds of your cases have parents with an alcohol or drug problem when those 30,000 kids were removed. Um, so what to do about that um, is part of the discussion, but recognizing that you have put a lot of effort into those information systems to be getting those data. With those data and that variation that you saw from less than 5% in some states to uh, three quarters of cases in a few of the states, even with that variation, when you look at the percentage of children who end up with parental rights terminated, this is the checkbox, parents had an alcohol or drug problem, and they ended up going to termination of parental rights and uh, in, in the country. So the second largest reason for termination of parental rights associated with those conditions at removal um, were parent alcohol and drug problems. Um, second only to neglect. And in most states, when we point out those data problems in collecting these data, 
um, most uh, professionals that work in the child welfare system say, well, we're, we're counting that as neglect. We may not actually count the alcohol or drug problems among parents, but, but that's largely what is uh, accounted for in neglect. And in many states or most states, the uh, conditions for removal are optional items in their data system. And so what gets checked is, is neglect as the reason for removal. So again, wanting to just sort of paint that picture, Texas has um, well over two thirds of the children being removed are related to parents' alcohol and drug problems. When we look at of those kids who are removed, by far the number one pop, the number one age group are infants. Kids who are children who are less than one year old uh, make up 50,000 out of the 262 in the country. And in Texas, uh, 4,300, these again are 2018 data. It is the largest population of children going into out-of-home care by far. Um, out of the 20,000 removals in 2018, uh, 4,300 were uh, children um, who were under 12 months. So needed big attention on this population of, of infants. When we look over time, you see the percentage of all child removals by, for both the nation and the orange bar for Texas, the percentage that were under one. So infants have been about a quarter of the population for quite a while uh, in Texas, or 20%, one out of five. Uh, and then of those that are under one, you see three quarters are have the checkbox that this is parent alcohol and drug problem. So infants being removed at uh, higher numbers of infants than other age groups, a uh, higher percentage, uh, or about 20% of the overall uh, being infants, and uh, three quarters of those have a parent with an alcohol or drug problem. These data come from national estimates of percentages of children in the population that are estimated to have been exposed to various substances. Um, so if you look at tobacco and the nurses that are in the room and, and I'm sure social workers and others, uh, uh, substance abuse counselors, um, they certainly recognize that tobacco has uh, effects during the prenatal period. It's why uh, we get lots of warnings about that, about smoking during pregnancy, about alcohol during pregnancy. We have mass dissemination through every alcohol outlet and alcohol bottle uh, to not drink during pregnancy. And uh, about 11% of women in this uh, most recent data that they are available um, are drinking during pregnancy. Uh, using illicit drugs is less, about eight and a half percent. When we look at binge drinking, which could be those that are leading to some of the FAS, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, kinds of challenges, uh, about five percent in the nation. Uh, and then heavy drinking, I'm sorry, binge drinking, and then this heavy drinking, 0.5 uh, percent, so 20,000. Uh, reporting heavy drinking. Those data come from the survey on drug use and health and other estimates that have been made in the literature, specific studies. When we look at the population of children that actually get uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome diagnosis, um, six per thousand births are some of the more recent data that have been estimated. You see the citations and the the end of the PowerPoint has all of the citations listed if you want to go back and see some of that. But you see the much you know, smaller number that are actually getting NAS diagnoses. And I had the opportunity to ask some experts on this recently about of children who are exposed, so that larger number of the illicit drug exposure, um, how many actually uh, in their experience, in their clinical practice, what percentage actually get an NAS diagnosis? 
um, and, and two different folks in the states told me that it was about 25%. And importantly, one of those experts said, um, but it doesn't necessarily predict life trajectory, that they have followed kids who got the NAS diagnosis and it didn't necessarily match up with the kinds of interventions or the severity of neurodevelopmental effects that they might have needed interventions for and vice versa, that they didn't get an NAS diagnosis at birth, which is you know, an immediate um, withdrawal symptom, syndrome, um, that they didn't get the NAS diagnosis at birth, and yet they did go on to need neurodevelopmental uh, interventions. So that six per thousand births, um, I think Texas has some of its own data about what that looks like for the number of NAS uh, diagnoses at birth. But remembering, I think the, the difference between uh, exposed um, affected and NAS, there are some gaps in between those numbers and we think important for each state and community who's working on these issues to be aware of those numbers and to hopefully be able to track those uh, in their own communities. And then those that actually have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder diagnosis, um, and these are sometimes really dated data, uh, but uh, those are the data that are available with a fairly large range of uh, infants that actually get an FAS diagnosis. And the reason, part of the reason why spending some time on these data and, and understanding exposed versus withdrawal symptoms is that that Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act um, defines some of these kind of characteristics or these populations, if you will. So this potentially affected by, and affected by becomes key in implementing that statute um, versus those that actually get the diagnosis of a withdrawal syndrome um, look a little bit different in all of our states and communities. Uh, and knowing which population we're talking about as we're trying to affect change and intervene on behalf of families becomes pretty important. In 2013, there was a review by Binicky and Smith of all of the literature of the 40 years of literature on the effects of uh, these various substances on children. And um, all of you in the audience know it's, it's very difficult to separate out one substance effects from others. And some would argue that it's not even uh, it doesn't warrant our attention, one substance versus the other, because it's not what we encounter uh, in real life about um, use during pregnancy. Uh, and we recognize for a long time, since the cocaine uh, era of the late 80s and early 90s, that so much of the postnatal environment is uh, important to understand in terms of the neurodevelopmental trajectory of children. But they looked at the 40 years of research on the short-term effects, and you see these four categories, birth anomalies, fetal growth, neural behavior, and withdrawal, and then the longer-term consequences or longer-term effects, if you will, of, a, of looking at achievement, uh, behavior, cognition, growth, and language. Uh, and this chart comes from their article. I know it's a lot on this, on this chart, uh, but you will have access to these slides or, and you do have the citation to go back and look at the Binicky and Smith article uh, that looks at this long term, uh, what has been published and what did they reach as a consensus of having an effect or not having an effect or not having enough data. And you see in the opiates um, that there are immediate short term effects uh, and some behavioral effects that have you know, remained consistent in the literature and some big gaps about what long-term effects look like. Whereas with methamphetamine, you see that there's a lot of areas of long-term effects that we don't know. And um, we certainly recognize that methamphetamine has not gone away, even with the attention that has been uh, appropriately given to opioids. Uh, but the stimulants, we get a lot of information more recently and uh, some coming from your state also about 
the increase in cocaine and in methamphetamine and stimulants. So we wanted to kind of take a minute to look at this chart again, introduce it to you, uh, and for you to know that you can go back and uh, look at those resources. So more recently in 2019, um, a group of the who's who of research on neonatal uh, opioid withdrawal. Uh, you see all of the authors that were that are listed on this review that was published in just 2019, just about six, eight months ago. It came out in pediatrics. Um, and another you know, review that's specific to opioids and specific to the effects across the developmental stages through early childhood on what does the what do the studies say about the effects. There's a lot of caveats to the data. Um, some of the studies are retrospective case reviews, which are certainly not as strong methodologically as a uh, controlled study. Um, few uh, controlled studies, uh, few actually with uh, sufficient comparison groups. But a couple of things to point out. Um, first, they in the article and in many different places are uh, asking all of us to refer to neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, syndrome versus NOWS, um, when it is in truly, when it is truly opioid withdrawal uh, as a specific and separate uh, syndrome that has a lot of information that's been collected about exposure to opioids over the years. And that NAS is the broader effect for uh, children exposed to other substances or sometimes unknown substances if you don't have a good uh, maternal history on that. So this is, I will make sure and give the caveat, this is my high-level summary of very detailed uh, review of the literature uh, and uh, summary of what the literature says on specifically for opioids. And you see some of the same kinds of of uh, outcomes or characteristics that were in the Finnecke and Smith review from 2013. Uh, but looking at those issues of um, the movement and arousal, uh, the state regulation, meaning can they regulate their, um, themselves as, uh, as newborns, uh, infancy, uh, some of those same kinds of neuromotor, psychomotor development that we saw in the previous uh, review, um, but no immediate during infancy cognition kinds of effects. Uh, and then as the child gets a little older, um, inconsistency in the findings on neurodevelopment, um, and there has been a large study on the differences between methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, so some differences in neurodevelopment and the other characteristics of, of childhood uh, ver on methadone versus some of those effects of, of, um, of buprenorphine. Uh, and then in early childhood up to uh, around age five and six, some of the studies go. Um, really some, again, mixed findings on cognition. Um, there are a few studies that looked at uh, executive functioning and visual motor effects and found some effects. Um, some, again, a little bit of that consistency in child behavior. But, but if we will, we're in the infancy, even with the, the number of years that we've been aware of opioid exposure in the prenatal period, we're still pretty young in understanding the effects um, as public policy has, has waned from time to time on really getting uh, studies up and running and over a long term. This is another more recent 2017 uh, study from uh, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, and they had access to their health data to identify infants who were diagnosed with NAS and they're using the broad definition of NAS uh, and identified 2,234 infants that became you know, older kids. Um, that they could identify um, those group, a uh, matched comparison on some of those key 
demographics of um, socioeconomic demographics, um, parent education, some other demographics that they were able to look at, and uh, uh, all of the other kids that were born in that cohort of those years in New South Wales. And Australia does standardized testing um, at third, fifth, and seventh grade. And they, they were able to get uh, the identifiers enough to be able to track these three different populations into the third, fifth, and seventh grade and to look at their academic performance. And while they don't have data on those other socioeconomic conditions, other characteristics of where the child is living, uh, removals for child welfare, disruption in early development um, that are controlled for all of those things um, among the NAS population. Um, you see that their school achievement at three, third, fifth, and seventh grade is lower than the match controls and lower than all of the other children in New South Wales. So uh, more to be revealed on these studies of looking long-term at achievement, but I thought important to mention this as one of the few studies that is looking long-term at effects on children. All right, let me pause there uh, before we move into the family-centered treatment section and see, Sharice, if there are any specific questions on uh, all of that lovely data. I had one question from early on. Um, it's from Meryl, and it was almost at the beginning of your presentation. It says, how can we get through, parent, get through to parents to be with their NAS baby in NICU? We're going to talk about that. That's a great one. So we're going to talk about changes that uh, hospitals are making to, uh, to uh, foster that dyad. And thanks so much, Meryl, for that question. And I'm going to uh, see if you still have the question after we get through uh, some of the next section. So thank you, Sharice. And we had one comment. It says, um, oh, it's also from Meryl, too. My NICU has poor parent visit history. She probably followed up after that with that question then. Okay, great. All right. So you're probably aware of some of the changes that are being made in uh, hospitals and automatic NICU transfers and how to do rooming in. And uh, we'd be happy to follow up individually with you to make sure that you have access to that information. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by family-centered treatment. We, we adopted, we meaning children and family futures, adopted this framework of looking at practice and policy many years ago, probably 15 years ago at least. Uh, it was included in the Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, their annual report some years ago, but we think continues to be relevant as we think through practice and policy at these various stages which are points of intervention for uh, parents and their children. Um, I think we're used to practice that waits until birth uh, to say, this is when we need to have a plan in place. Uh, we have a baby that's affected by uh, uh, prenatal exposure. We need to call CPS. We need to get an emergency hold. Um, a lot of crisis at the time of birth. And sometimes appropriate because we haven't had an opportunity to engage with that mom, with that family during the prenatal period. But what we're asking communities to really do is to look at these various points in time and, and what could be put in place earlier on to both reduce the crisis at birth and, and for all of the professionals and for the family and for the infant. And to have a plan in the prenatal period, if you're a substance use treatment agency and you have a mom who's pregnant, I think we would say it's your responsibility to make sure there's a plan before she gives birth about where the baby's going to go. Does CPS agree with this? Um, who's going to take care of the baby? Is mom stable in her recovery that baby can and should go home with birth family? Or 
is mom in and out of treatment and, and not stable and we need to be concerned about safety issues and there are not enough protective factors available that says this is a child, this is an infant who needs that kind of emergency response. Um, and then importantly in this immediate postpartum period, um, we hear more and more, there are some data uh, about overdose deaths in the postpartum period, about um, this increased attention that's needed that uh, uh, Dr. Turplin refers to as the fourth trimester. I'm sure many people are using that now in terms of not after birth, just letting go of those supports, but making sure that those supports are in place for the family in that post-birth environment also. And then looking at uh, post-infancy to the child developmental kinds of aspects that we just talked about. What are those areas of development that need assessment? How do infants and young children and older children get those assessments? What does that mean for early intervention services in our communities, for Part C, for special education? all along the ways in which across the developmental spectrum interventions are needed or at least understanding that this child needs to be assessed and perhaps needs intervention and sometimes those are more challenging than even the prenatal period of getting uh, mom engaged in treatment and stable in the prenatal period so access to services access to intervention uh, in infancy, toddlerhood, older children uh, becomes really critical public policy that um, we need to be focused on. So again, a way for us to organize when we say we have to do something about NAS um, in our communities. Well, which part? Our pre-pregnancy and primary prevention or after birth or in the prenatal period. So we are um, preparing for and getting uh, pregnant women into treatment. So we're gonna, this idea of organizing our practice and our policy by these time points of intervention we think is important. So if we take those points of intervention and we say, well, we recognize that just as Meryl suggested, how do we keep moms and uh, babies together? Um, what does that mean to be family-centered? Um, in the substance use disorder treatment world, we think that means that each of the members of the family has a way to access the interventions that they need. It may be child development for the infant. It may be uh, domestic violence interventions for the parent. It may be some of the core supports that are needed in terms of housing and income support. Um, but it means that each of the needs of the family, and sometimes, that you uh, birth mom says that the family includes my mom. It's the Anna, or uh, I started to say Nana, but it came out Anna. Nana, because I just am a new Nana. Uh, maybe it's Nana, and uh, or the other uh, aunts and other family members that are stepping in. We know that uh, an increasing number of grandparents are parenting the children that are in the child welfare system. So how do we take this family centeredness and really understand to keep the child safe, to keep the child on the path to well-being? what does that look like in terms of the family? So parents are supported in their parenting roles. Um, what does that look like in the immediate post-birth environment in the hospital? If you really change the hospital environment to say our objective is that parents, birth parents, are supported in their roles as parents, what kind of changes would that mean that were, were necessary in that hospital environment? I've, I've mentioned these other two already with children having the uh, remediation that they may need and the interventions that they may need. It means that parents' recovery and child well-being are not so desperate, in meaning uh, disparate, I mean, sorry, in terms of um, where our focus is, but that the family recovery and the family well-being becomes the, the bridge between what we often hear about service systems that were focused on the infant, were focused on the child, were focused on the development of the child, 
almost in isolation from the parent who's in treatment. So if we're really looking at a family focus, we're recognizing these circles and we're recognizing where the bridge is to make sure that family recovery is one of those outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, is that what gets measured in our major data sets um, that we're looking at outcomes? Not always, but you can interpret some of the Child and Family Service Review data as a way to say, how do we look at family well-being as well as child well-being. And a lot of those decisions are state decisions. So this idea, again, that we have this uh, bridge of the family to look at um, the interventions uh, as well as the outcome measures. Uh, so really that being the glue, that the, the collaborative effort that's needed is held together with the glue of outcomes. Um, if we have jointly held outcomes in our community about what we're trying to achieve, that's what allows the systems to come together and work together. Um, some of these characteristics about encourages the parenting role, uh, increases the parenting skills, and enhances the child well-being uh, in an effort that is supporting the whole family. And, and I don't say that just lightly. I recognize it's hard to do. Our funding systems, our data collection systems, the way in which practice and policy rolls out in the various government agencies, all the way down to local regions and counties, all are geared to be separate systems. It takes a lot of work to say, if we're supporting families, we have to put all these systems together. We have to look at the funding sources and the data systems in order to build those bridges. So I, I say, you know, gee, it's these things, recognizing that it's a lot of work behind that for a community to, uh, to be able to adapt to a family-centered, a family-focused approach. I mentioned this already uh, in terms of the postpartum period. I won't go through that, but again, you see the citations. Uh, if this is something in your community that would be useful to be able to focus on that postpartum uh, period is to really understand to what extent this is an issue or a challenge in your community that you need to get a handle on. So supporting that mother-infant diet in some of the, the work that is going on in looking at the, the interventions for NAUs, neonatal opioid withdrawal, and more broadly, uh, NAS, um, recognizing that this time period is really the critical time to establish that bond. Um, what some of the uh, hospitals around the country found that it took a long time to change attitudes about this is the goal that we're trying to achieve, that children do better when they can stay with their mother. And unless there are immediate safety concerns, that that's the best environment for the child. And that actually starting with the staff makes a lot of difference in terms of what, how those interactions go in supporting that relationship. Um, you see that third point that came out of these studies that nurses that demonstrated uh, caring behaviors towards the mother were better able to help them recognize, interpret those cues of establishing that relationship in that dyad um, and enhancing those interactions. Um, you know, many people on the phone may have, may remember uh, that initial time of that bonding period with your infant, but it's challenging. It's challenging. And if you aren't necessarily interpreting those infant cues about they're rejecting me, no, they're crying for something else, and you need to figure out what that cry means. Those are challenging times for all of us. If you're in early recovery, or perhaps have um, some of the implications of uh, that crisis at birth going on, you got a whole lot on your mind. So how we are supporting parents 
to be able to bond with that child um, starts before birth, but also in that immediate postpartum period, the neonatal period, um, to change our environments that are supportive of that mother-infant dyad. This is some of the, the literature again that um, why is that a challenge, the mother-infant dyad, um, when a mom has a substance use disorder? Um, you, you see, I won't read all of them, um, but what's going on in her life? and trying to understand what's going on in her life as a way to intervene to support that dyad is a way for us to think through what's happening in the hospital, in the birthing center, in the postpartum period, um, when we're thinking about and trying to um, establish that dyad with birth parents and their infant about some of those things that go on in in all of our communities. Um, if, and when we talk a little bit about the, um, the work that was done in, uh, at Yale about trying to transition into a different mode of assessing children, um, they found frankly that some of the staff on the maternity wards um, you know, just weren't able to do this new environment um, of really supporting uh, moms with substance use disorders in a way that was uh, trying to help them uh, bond with their baby in this dyadic relationship. Um, for the child, um, there's also challenges for them uh, in looking at making sure that we're uh, focused on the neglect kinds of issues that might be raised, the safety issues, um, but that immediate postpartum period of any of the effects that they may be experiencing, which are ha acting as a challenge for the infant or child uh, to maintain that relationship with their, with their birth parent. So I think this is important work in, um, it's not just the mom who's not engaging or is disappearing. It's also, we know all of the environmental conditions that uh, birth parents are experiencing both in their home environment, in their family, in the hospital, in their community. And when we take that perspective of understanding what are those challenges uh, to improve the outcome for the infant by, by taking a serious look at those challenges and what we can do. We've talked about this uh, poll already um, and we're gonna turn our attention to plans of safe care uh, and first of all, that legislation that changed some of the things that uh, communities are responsible for uh, based on that legislation. So uh, I think I'll take a pause before we get into that. And um, Sharice, any other comments or questions that we should address? Yep, we got a few here. So um, this is from um, M. Rangel. How do we do this if mom is not willing to disclose her current pregnancy, although there is a currently active case? You know, one of the ways that a lot of jurisdictions are, are working with pregnant moms and, mo and um, new mothers with substance use disorder is a lot of peer support, a lot of parent mentors, that kind of approach of engagement. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that if you were in her situation and were unsure about what the Child Protective Service reaction is going to be, or her physician, or the stigma, the experience at, at the hospital. I know that Texas has had a, an effort for quite some time to use peer support in lots of different settings. Uh, and this is one of them in the prenatal clinic that has proved to be very powerful in many jurisdictions. And if you'd like additional information about that and connecting you to some of those jurisdictions that are using uh, peer support, peer specialist in the prenatal period, we'd be happy to follow up with you about um, you know, what that looks like and their challenges and, and, and what they had to put in place to make that happen. Okay, the next question is from Charles. It says on item two, prenatal, I think it's important that folks 
know that a pregnant woman on opioids should not be medically detoxed during pregnancy as it could harm fetus. Mom should be placed on Medicaid assisted treatment, methadone or buprenorphine. Yeah, medication assisted treatment. Yes, absolutely. And um, if there are any of those uh, communities that uh, struggle with this, there's a very strong statement from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and the Addiction Society, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine that jointly have put out statements about uh, the treatment during the prenatal period for uh, pregnant women with opioid use disorders uh, is medication assisted treatment and lots of research behind that. So thank you, Charles, for uh, reminding us of that and making sure that we have uh, you know, that we meant that we focus on that and that again, there's uh, lots of resources that are available through the National Center if you need uh, any information about that in your particular community. Thank you for that. And then this looks like a comment. Agencies tend to not look at family recovery, which causes fear in the parents to cooperate and be truthful slash trusting of the programs, but in place to assist with abstinence. Oh, put in place to assist with abstinence? Again, the, uh, I definitely understand that comment and agree that um, the variation from community to community, sometimes office to office, sometimes a treatment agency to child welfare agency and their relationship, um, those are, are tough collaborative partnerships sometimes to make. And that the again, bridge that often is being put in place is someone who is a person in recovery or a trained paraprofessional uh, that is trained in engagement strategies for families and making sure that they have a safe place where they're able to get the services that they need and understand what the implications for them are um, with services and without services. And um, typically without services is uh, not the preferred choice. But, it, you know, I, I think that when I try and, and take, a, take another perspective or others perspective on this, I can imagine that, you know, my son is very old, but even in those days um, of being pregnant, you know, it would be really hard to, to say, you know, this is what's going on in my life with all of these unknowns. So part of that prenatal plan of safe care says here are the knowns, here are the, the things that we can tell you about, about what this plan of safe care is to do and how you can participate in that plan of safe care and really use an empowerment engagement strategy during the prenatal period. Um, to us, that seems really key so that we don't get to the birth event. Um, women are scared, they're potentially not delivering in the hospital and placing themselves and the infant at risk, or they're you know, leaving right away to try and hide. Uh, sometimes when they want to be bonded with their child and uh, they, they can't for various reasons related to their own situation, their own substance use disorder, you know, backing up again into the prenatal period allows all of that information exchange and those engagement strategies to happen. Okay, there's one, uh, one more question. Outreaching to pregnant women and moms on are using opioids is still very difficult. They do not readily come forward. We make inroads, but numbers are still very low. How do we encourage moms to seek prenatal care? Boy, that is, that is one of those uh, big challenges. And I hate to say that um, the strategy is the same, uh, but in many ways it is. And there are communities that have set up uh, specific kinds of prenatal clinics in which uh, the understanding among staff, the engagement among staff is focused on this particular population. Um, I would refer you to a publication that we have that documents uh, what's referred to as the CHARM 
Collaborative in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, it's been in existence for well over a decade now, and it is a high-risk pregnancy clinic that brings in the community supports that are needed for families so that there's a lot of incentive uh, to participate uh, and in prenatal care and in the services that might be needed by the family to provide a safe environment for the infant to grow. Um, and all of, all of that is documented in that case study uh, and the various strategies that they put in place to engage uh, this specific population, pregnant women with opioid use disorders, and how they're doing that across now across the state of Vermont. They started in in uh, in, in Burlington, and other communities have put together. Charm stands for um, Children and Recovering Moms Together, uh, and Recovering Moms, sorry. Um, and they have a lot of success in engaging moms with. Uh, some specific strategies that, that they have employed. So we will uh, make sure that um, Sharice and the conference organizers get access to that uh, publication. I think it's listed at the back of this PowerPoint as one of the resources. It's an appendix uh, that writes up that case study and their experience. We also have on the website for the National Center uh, a webinar that they conducted about um, the the Charm Collaborative and their challenges and their successes and, and what worked for them. All right, let's move on to uh, talk some specifics about CAPTA. Uh, originated in 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. These are the points that uh, changes to CAPTA specifically mentioned uh, families with substance use disorders and infants with prenatal exposure. Um, actually, this, this requirement that there be a plan of safe care started in 2003. Uh, in 2010, the act was amended to include alcohol uh, in those infants that were affected by uh, substance abuse. And in 2016, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act made several changes to CAPTA. In particular, they clarified the population that requires a plan of safe care. Um, they specifically removed the word illegal. Previously, it said uh, as being affected by illegal substance abuse. It now says being affected by substance abuse. These three categories, remember back to that chart when I said there's these three categories, those are the three categories that are in CARA that require healthcare providers to I, um, notify Child Protective Services when there is an infant identified in these three categories, born with and affected by substance abuse, experiencing withdrawal symptoms, or uh, a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, those three populations. That plan of safe care requirement was also changed that it needed to, the development of the plan needed to address the health and substance use disorder treatment needs of the, of the infant and the affected family or caregiver. So this is a bridge. It's another one of the bridges between substance abuse treatment, child welfare, and health, health professionals. Child welfare has the responsibility to report on the activities of developing and implementing and monitoring plans of safe care. Hospitals have the responsibility when these infants are identified to notify Child Protective Services, very carefully notified, is not making a report of, ch of child abuse or neglect. Specifically, it says the responsibility is to notify. Child welfare's responsibility is to, um, is to oversee those plans of safe care in terms of reporting the data uh, through the data system to the extent that they can report those data to the federal government. So those in the from child welfare in the audience, I'm sure are very familiar with some of those requirements. Um, that was the extent practicable that these data could be uh, collected. Uh, and there's some specific data points that are required um, to the extent that the state can to be reported through the NCANS data system, the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. Um, some jurisdictions have taken these data requirements 
and reported them in the aggregate. That is Children's Bureau has said that that meets the letter of the law, that particularly in this population, um, when Charles mentioned the uh, pregnant women on medication assisted treatment, um, if during that prenatal period, this mom is really stable, um, this mom doesn't, this family doesn't have immediate safety factors in which you need to be concerned about child abuse and neglect. Um, this is a pop, this is a group of, of infants that perhaps having the aggregate of those numbers versus what would meet criteria for safety factors, which would necessitate, necessitate, uh, require, there we go, require uh, a report of potential child abuse or neglect. So this differentiation between reporting child abuse and neglect and notifying Child Protective Services that the hospital has identified an infant affected by. Um, CARA also specifically requires the monitoring and the oversight by the, in the annual report that the state files in, for the Child Abuse Prevention Act funds that those state agencies specifically report on their activities related to these requirements for notification and for a plan of safe care. Um, and that states are ensuring that those are being implemented and that, the, again, a bridge between treatment and child welfare, that the families have the referrals and the delivery of appropriate services as, you know, as specified in their plan. So again, their primary changes in CAPTA change the definitions of who a plan of safe care is required for and that uh, treatment needs for the family or caregiver uh, that has been affected um, it are included in the plan. It, re it specifies those data to be reported and um, the monitoring functions of the state reporting to the federal government in exchange for their CAPTA state grant. I will mention that there have been um, large increases in the CAPTA state grant for the last, uh, I might get this wrong, three years, um, uh, that with this first change in 2016, typically the CAPTA state grant was in the 20 million range across the whole country, which is hardly any for a state as big as Texas. Um, and that was increased, it's been three years in a row now, if, I, if my memory serves me right on the three years, uh, to $60 million. So additional funds that were given to states to ensure that these kinds of plans and these policies were being implemented. Um, states have a lot of discretion about what they can do with their CAPTA state grant. Um, it's an area that if there are folks from the state agencies and the webinar today, um, you may be already looking at what is going on with that uh, CAPTA state grant. Uh, but if you're in a community and you're not aware, I would encourage you to, um, to look into what happened in the expansion of the CAPTA state grant which happened simultaneously to these changes in the requirements for plans of safe care. So what does that mean? Um, in Texas, the statute regarding plans of safe care says that the Department of Family and Protective Services may schedule a family meeting or a family group conference to develop a safety plan for the support of the exposed newborn and his or her family. Um, and that the monitoring function is not specifically addressed in statutes or the regulations, at least that, that we had uh, access to. Um, so you see that some of those things that are discretion by the state agency um, still may have uh, some implementation uh, pieces that are going on in Texas as we speak. What does that mean, a plan of safe care? We think it is about bringing together these three existing plans. You might say, I'm in the hospital, we have a discharge plan, we give referrals, or we mention in that discharge plan what the family should be pursuing in terms of the baby's health care and the mom's health care. Typically, that is driven by the health care components of the case. 
The Substance Use Disorder Treatment Agency has their treatment plan. Um, I don't know in to what extent family-centeredness is happening in those treatment plans, but largely what we see is that's geared to the substance use treatment of the parent and may or may not address some of those other components of the needs of the child. And then the safety plan for child protective services, in this case, we left it child welfare services, uh, but in your department, the safety plan, which is mentioned, remember, in that statute, that it says that they may schedule a family meeting or family group conference to develop a safety plan for the newborn and his or her family. So it's this part of the safety plan that's mentioned in the Texas uh, statutes that are a possible way to implement those safety plans in terms of a family meeting. So what's different about a and a safe care? Um, again, we think that those three things are brought together to make it a package for a family. That all of those silos about how families experience our service systems are recognized and made coherent. Uh, in a way that um, the domains of all of those components that we've talked about are included in this plan. We recognize that not one template is going to be uh, possible across all of the country uh, in every state based on your child welfare practice and policy manuals, um, the substance use treatment, uh, guidelines and manuals and requirements from the state agency and local agencies. Um, but we do have some templates that are available if you are interested in looking at what are, what have some other states done in established template. And Texas may be far along on this and have their own templates already available, um, which is something again at the local level to find out. Uh, is there a template, a plan of safe care that we can follow at the local level? We recognize in the work that we've been doing for some six, eight years specific to infants with prenatal exposure that when these plans are multidisciplinary, that it helps the family tremendously, um, that there's a multidisciplinary assessment that folks are coming to uh, the table with this is the health uh, con considerations that we have, the plan, the substance use treatment, the child welfare components, also home visiting, public health, uh, key partners that are needed. Again, it has a family focus that we remember that the plan of safe care addresses the uh, needs of the affected family or caregiver as well as the needs of the infant. Um, again, we can't emphasize enough uh, whenever possible when that engagement for pregnant women is happening, when you either have the pregnant woman in prenatal care or substance use treatment or the emergency room coming in during the time when she's pregnant for other kind of health related issues. Um, if she's not actively engaged in treatment, if she's not act actively engaged in prenatal care, that we look at those various doors in which this woman may be interacting in our community. It may be in the police. Uh, it may be law enforcement that is potentially interacting. When we look at those engagement strategies across all of those public health and social service systems and law enforcement systems, how do we make sure that that's an engagement opportunity for that particular family? Obviously, making sure that the, uh, that the plan is available to all of the systems uh, and that the practices are, are grounded in evidence-based uh, and evidence-informed practice about those engagement strategies. Um, the plan of safe care, again, you've heard this now how many times, <laughs> ideally? developed prior to birth, um, comprehensive, again, multiple intervention points. If it's not in the prenatal period, what happens at birth? If it's not at birth, what's happening in the child's developmental follow-up with pediatricians or public health or home visiting? Who's following up with that baby after birth in which 
this is, again, a multiple intervention point that we can engage with this family uh, to ensure the, the long-term success for the family and that the neurodevelopmental needs of the child are being met. Who are they for? Um, again, an infant born with and affected by substance abuse or withdrawal symptoms resulting from prenatal drug exposure or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. States, communities have needed to engage in multidisciplinary planning to make some definitions about that. Um, it, the statute and the federal guidance doesn't go beyond uh, born with and affected by. Those are decisions for states and communities and tribes to make. Um, how will you define uh, born with and affected by? Is it that they got an NAS diagnosis? Um, some communities, if, is it that the, your, the mom is known during the prenatal period and then it's known exposure and so we're going to cast a wide net? Um, those are decisions that each community uh, has the discretion to make under this statute. Uh, but importantly, having healthcare providers as well as substance use treatment providers at the table for some of those decisions about those definitions uh, becomes really important. I've talked about this a little bit already in talking about you know, moms or pregnant women rather in you know, different categories, if you will. And, and not to cast this as a, a uh, discrete grouping, but what we hear is that sometimes uh, pregnant women who go to deliver um, are in this second group of receiving medication uh, for an opioid use disorder, um, using buprenorphine, using methadone, is actively engaged in treatment for their substance use during the prenatal period. They get to the hospital and they're treated like they're in this third category of somebody who's not engaged in treatment, who's still misusing illegal substances, who may still be drinking. They're not engaged in treatment. So differentiation between those two populations becomes really important, both in the prenatal period and knowledge of this at birth. Because when we think about changing our approach to parents to be able to stay with their children, Knowing which population we're dealing with would help cut down some of the noise in the, in the uh, hospital about, as well as the communication noise with Child Protective Services. So I don't wanna forget this first population that um, there are infants who may be affected by uh, prenatal substance use, not abuse perhaps, that are, in this category of using an illegal drug, it becomes substance or using a legal drug, or it becomes substance abuse when using illegal drugs in the prenatal period, or maybe using opioids for a chronic position, a chronic condition, or other kinds of, of, of prescriptions during the prenatal period that can result in a withdrawal syndrome. So again, if we don't have a way that we're really thinking about is this pregnant mom in, if you will, category population one versus population two, stable in treatment, um, or population three, not stable in treatment, and we potentially have some concerns about the child's safety, it would help in the approach and the communication across systems if we understood this in the beginning. And again, the case study from the CHARM Collaborative helps to understand um, which are the families that are struggling? Which are the pregnant women that are struggling? Which are the pregnant women giving birth that are struggling versus, aha, mom's in methadone or mom's on buprenorphine. Treatment provider is engaged with her. Treatment provider seeing her frequently. You know, Child Protective Services also use, often uses the term, you know, eyes on. The treatment agency has eyes on, if you will, because they're engaging with that mom um, for an extended period of time. How you build the trust between the, the, that methadone provider or that substance use treatment agency and the child welfare agency to say, this is what we're looking for in terms of stability for this infant, stability for this infant to go home. 
that's the hard work for communities to do. Building that trust, specifying what it is that CPS needs to know, specifying what treatment agencies need to know from the child welfare agency and from the health provider. Um, those three things become pretty uh, critical. I've mentioned some of those state definitions that states are responsible for making. Um, affected by, we mentioned, um, if, if that is uh, in a state that sometimes they've defined that as a toxicology test uh, during uh, pregnancy or at birth or for the infant at birth, uh, and then they have defined that as affected by. Um, that may be that large category of exposure that the infant doesn't actually go through an abstinence syndrome, which there are a fair number, again, back to my consult with some experts, um, they said about 75% of infants don't get an NAS diagnosis. So if you're looking at that toxicology test or during the prenatal period, you may have a big population there. Um, so what does your state, what does your community do in terms of ensuring safety and developmental um, interventions when needed for that larger population. But important to even know those numbers in your community. Um, and then the third is some states that have uh, based that definition on those reports uh, during the birth event um, and, and that, that time, point in time in which they're making that determination. Okay. Everybody in the audience, I could have you turn on your mics and you could say it together. When could they be developed? They could be developed in the prenatal period, you know, lo and behold. In fact, in, um, in Burlington, they, you know, it's a fairly small community, uh, but if I remember these numbers right, they said that they had about 40 deliveries a month that um, there was, you know, the crisis at birth was happening before they started this uh, engaging through prenatal clinics with the substance use treatment agency. Um, they have specific state statute that allows a, a home assessment to be done in the 30 days before the delivery date so that Child Protective Services is engaged and knows where this baby is going before the birth. So in this population one, um, we think that there's some other folks that could be developing this plan of safe care. Um, if this mom is receiving uh, prescriptions that potentially the baby could withdraw from, um, the prenatal care provider could be developing that plan of safe care and engaging with uh, treatment agencies if needed and child protective services. In that second population of their own uh, methadone or buprenorphine, we believe that that opioid treatment provider has a big responsibility to make sure that that plan of safe care is in place in concert with the parent that's the, with the pregnant woman um, to make sure that that is understood in the prenatal period and that they've built the relationship with Child Protective Services so that they too think that the plan of safe care developed by the OTP, the Opioid Treatment Program, is what they want to see in their plan of safe care. Um, and that partnership, that relationship, I think is what a lot of substance use treatment agencies are looking for with common understanding about what that implication will be uh, at the time of birth. And then in the third category, there may be substance use treatment agencies that have engaged, mom has bounced in, a pregnant woman rather has bounced in and out of treatment. Um, they may be in and out of a, a high-risk pregnancy clinic, uh, but we think of, of that population is appropriate for the child welfare agency to be doing the plan of safe care, making sure that they're doing a risk and safety assessment um, and making sure that that child is um, in a safe environment. So I hope that's helpful in thinking about these populations and who could be doing the plan of safe care in the prenatal period. And, and if the child is not uh, identified until birth, um, what that would look like in terms of partnerships. 
this again um, specifies some more detail about um, who could be doing this. Um, and there is specific information memo from Children's Bureau uh, that also supports this idea that uh, the Substance Use Treatment Agency in partnership with Child Protective Services uh, can be doing these plans of safe care. There are specific requirements, as I mentioned, that Child Protective Services must do in their reporting. So they must be engaged, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a woman, pregnant woman who's stable in opioid treatment uh, has to have the plan of safe care developed and monitored by Child Protective Services. It does take a partnership. It does take making sure that those partnerships are specified and that there's understanding across those agencies. And then again, uh, in that population three, that Child Welfare Services has a uh, responsibility. So state interpretations, um, the, re the legislation on what's notification. So I've mentioned this before that the federal statute says that healthcare providers that identify uh, the infants in these three categories are responsible for notifying Child Protective Services. Um, what that looks like inside Child Protective Services, is there a specialized unit that gets those notifications versus that population three, if you will, that is a, a child abuse uh, report and needs a safety and risk assessment done. Um, those are things that can be worked out in communities. There's a lot of, uh, of leeway. There's a lot of ways in which communities can define for themselves how these processes are going to work. Um, the state interpretations on how regulations come out. What are the regs for those OTPs if you have a pregnant woman? What is the regulation for Child Protective Services if they've received a notification? Um, lots of states have said, you know, it's kind of different tracks. If it's a notification, they have a partnership with the OTP, the pregnant woman is stable, the plan of safe care is in place, that's a different path than, uh, than reports. And then in that, um, my screen isn't showing that last category for me to make sure that I'm reading that, but the uh, making sure that those notifications and the definitions and the support for families are in um, regulations, practice, and policy, uh, that those are state interpretations. Uh, again, way states have been doing this, um, we've talked about this a little bit about different tracks. If there's a call to the hotline, where does that go? How does Child Protective Service respond to that? Um, we've got just a bit of time left, uh, so I will not uh, belabor this, but the why I think we've covered. Um, the implications for children of not being identified and having early intervention put in place um, is one aspect and probably the most important part of uh, why this needs to happen. Uh, but it also is about building that collaboration and the cost savings that can happen uh, when the systems are working together. Um, again, who could do uh, really built on that shared trust and knowledge. And we've created some materials about uh, developing those protocols for communication, about developing that trust between the agencies. Uh, we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, I'm going to run through that quickly. It is this collaborative approach that says um, we're identifying during pregnancy, we're engaging very using very specific engagement protocols um, and that the plan is about reducing the number of crises at birth for women, babies, and the system. Um, the Child Protective Services having to go out and doing hospital holds, et cetera. Um, I, I think I neglected to follow up on that story from Burlington that they had you know, 40 or so of those births um, per month and they've reduced that to a few a few women in their community that aren't identified through various paths of intervention or various paths of, of, um, of being engaged in various systems that rarely do they have a 
pregnant woman that goes to deliver uh, that they aren't already aware of and don't already have a plan for. It's a unique opportunity. It's a unique opportunity because no one single agency can do this. Um, substance use treatment can't do it alone. Healthcare providers can't do it alone. The NICUs can't do it alone. Child welfare can't do it alone. It really takes that come together. Uh, so that necessity of working together because these are often multi-generational problems, um, they can typically only be addressed through a, a coordinated approach across those multiple systems. Um, and that meaningful collaborative collaboration is more than having a monthly meeting to share information. It's getting into the guts of the paperwork. It's getting into the guts of the data systems. It's monitoring families that are crossing over between our systems. It's about making sure that we're focused on the outcomes that are the glue uh, across the agency to make that happen. We have created, we the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare have created a few different tools for uh, implementing plans of safe care. We have a, a guidance document on our website that's available to you now. And uh, we've gone the next step from that broad guidance document from early on after the legislation was passed uh, to develop a more uh, discrete learning modules. And you see what each of these uh, modules look like in terms of uh, action step and, and uh, templates for these various components of putting plans of safe care in place. Um, my next topic was Charles topic of making sure that we recognizing that uh, medication assisted treatment evens out that uterine environment for pregnant women and it becomes critical to have a stable pregnant woman and fetus uh, to prevent relapse. Um, recognizing the benefits of medication assisted treatment. I mentioned the Yale group, uh, Dr. Grossman, who been about a decade um, trying to change the environment in their hospital and where they ended up was changing their uh, process of what they're looking for in treatment, uh, identification and treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And many of you have probably heard this eat, sleep, consult, the developmental challenges for a newborn to be able to eat, to be able to sleep and to be able to console themselves. Um, and this is being implemented in many um, sites around the country in a perinatal collaborative that they're really trying to focus on uh, not an immediate removal to the NICU, uh, but providing an environment for rooming in between the, the birth mom and the infant, uh, the family that is focused on supportive messages about how to understand these challenges for a newborn of eating, sleeping, and consoling, and what the health professional can do to support birth mom in ensuring that that is happening. I have lots of state strategies to talk about, and I'm going to leave those for you to peruse in your free time after this webinar. Uh, because I do want to make sure that we are ending on time. We have a couple minutes left. Um, Charisse, if there are any comments or questions in our last two minutes together. All right, I just asked everybody to send them in. So we'll give it a minute and see what we come up with. I did have a comment from earlier that I forgot to read to you. Um, it is from Lena. It says, educating the mother on what to expect when she delivers her baby is important. Here in San Antonio, we have the Mommies Program from Alpha Home, where we educate the mommies about NAS and, providing, and provide parenting skills necessary for her to have her baby with her. As a community, we should all be informed of what resources are available to our clients. Excellent. So San Antonio, um, I know that there are some other communities that have put this in place across Texas, but um, perhaps we need a, a network in, inside Texas uh, that of these um, experts on this issue to share further their experience, uh, their challenges, and what's working uh, to make sure that those best practices are being put in place for, for infants and their, and their caregivers, their parents.
Thanks, Lena, for sharing that. And thank you for the work that you're doing. All right, there's no more questions as of right now. Okay, well, I will point out that we have uh, clinical guidance that's available from SAMHSA on treatment of opioid use disorders in pregnant women, uh, a publication that the National Center did on how to do this collaborative approach. Uh, this is the planning guide that uh, I mentioned is available for implementing plans of safe care and the coming soon. Uh, of the modules that uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, go on to our website uh, for the National Center, send us an email or sign up for our listserv. And when these are made available and finally uh, in the final approval stage, we will make sure that those learning modules come out to you. We will, I'm sure, be doing web-based uh, dissemination uh, but in this PowerPoint, you'll see the details that are in each of these uh, modules that are coming out. Uh, the fact sheet on finding quality treatment, which is important for all child welfare and health providers uh, to know the, the experts in their communities uh, on substance use treatment. Uh, and just to mention that there are online tutorials on our website uh, for uh, various professionals that are free of charge and free CEUs uh, on one geared to substance use treatment agencies about child welfare in the courts, uh, one geared to child welfare about substance use disorders treatment and recovery, and one geared to legal professionals who are working in um, child welfare cases in the family court. With that, uh, I'm sorry I rushed through that end. That happens sometimes when we kind of get going on some of those things that get me excited about this work. Appreciate so much the, uh, again, conference organizers inviting us to share information with you today and encourage you, again, to visit our website, be in touch with us if you have any questions, uh, lots of examples to share with you. Thank you so much, Sharice, and to the other conference organizers. Thank you, Dr. Young. You have a wonderful day. It was a great presentation. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.